the parliamentary uh, legal advisor on the ultra bill. Uh, and as uh, we uh, look into a uh, land tenure uh, rights, um, we have to uh, reflect uh, particularly from what uh, Justice uh, Goliath uh, AJ uh, in the Rahube matter states that uh, we need to be able to reflect upon the present uh, when we need to ask ourselves whether the African women truly benefits from the full protection of the constitution. Moreover, we must establish whether enough has been done to eradicate the discrimination and inequality that so many women face daily. He further states that laws and policies must seek to do more than merely regulate formalistically the legislature is, the, is enjoyed to ensure that laws and policies promote the participation of women in social economy and political spheres, while also advancing the spirit, uh, purport, and objects of the Constitution. We therefore, honorable uh, members, welcome the amendment of the Ultra Bill and we believe that it is long overdue. Unfortunately, it took legislation by a woman who is discriminated by this piece of legislation for this amendment to take place. In dealing with this bill, the committee must consider the matters raised by the Constitutional Court, especially to direct or indirectly the unfair discrimination of any person on the basis of entirely their gender and sex. We must also look out for any other clauses or provisions that might render this bill unconstitutional and subject of another litigation. We note very well, honorable members, that they still lack of a comprehensive tenure legislation envisioned in section 25, subsection 6 of the Constitution, especially in relation to all persons living on former homeland territories like myself, including the TBVC states. We appreciate that the department is developing a communal land tenure bill. This is the matter of priority that this committee will follow closely. I therefore want to welcome you, honorable members, on this afternoon session. Also welcome the honorable minister, the deputy ministers, the DG, and the officials of the department. Also, let us welcome our parliamentary legal advisor who is uh, with us and uh, will uh, be given time to also share their thoughts on the bill. But I uh, will now invite the Honorable Minister Mamuti Deza to uh, give uh, introduction remarks. Uh, we note that she has other engagements and uh, therefore she will be excused as soon as she's been able to attend uh, to uh, the opening remarks. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Mandela, as well as members of the uh, Portfolio Committee, Senior okay. Official, Parliamentary Legal Representative, as well as uh, other members who may be in this platform. I must firstly say that we would like to thank the Portfolio Committee for really having been patient, but also guiding us. No, on honorable. Now you may proceed, Honorable Minister. Your video wasn't switched on, and that's what I was bringing to your attention. Please proceed. Thank you very much, um, Honorable uh, Mandela and members of the committee, the legal representative, both of the department and of uh, parliament. 
and other members who may be on this platform, the Director General. We would like to thank first and foremost the chairperson and the members of the Portfolio Committee for having guided and given us advice in relation to the amendment of this legislation, particularly last year that in their own assessment, they actually felt that we were not going to be able to meet the deadline. And through their advice, we did approach the court and get got the in extension until yeah. November. And we're therefore appreciative for that work that the committee, uh, on your part, you gave us advice and insights. I want to also say that this uh, legislation, particularly the challenge that was brought to it, has indeed brought impetus on finalizing the long-lasting legislation in terms of tenure reform in those areas that such a codification in statute has not been done. You'll appreciate, honorable members, that in the transition period, just after democracy, you had two pieces of legislation, the upgrading of land tenure, Act, as well as the IPILRA, the Informal Protection of Land Rights uh, Act. All of those to provide an accommodation before the final legislation is made. And I must say that many other issues happen in the intervening period. The department in the mid-2000 tried to put a final legislation, which was the Communal um, Land Tenure Act, or CLARA as it was known. Unfortunately, certain sections of that uh, legislation were actually challenged in court. And the minister then later withdrew the legislation, which I think had set us back in terms of finalizing the tenure rights of people under communal areas. Honourable members, you know that this matter of tenure security has also arisen in the discussion in the House of Traditional Leaders nationally, as well in the provinces, to upon gov infer rather upon government that it is important that such issue must be finalised once and for all. As president made an announcement about the release of state land, again, this yeah. issue emerged to say, what about the then 13% um, hectares of land that is in communal areas? What is the government doing about that? There are processes, honorable members, that are on stream following the discussions that we've had with the house, the two visits uh, that have happened in Botswana, as well as Uganda, trying to look at how we can frame our own local dispensation in respect of communal land. So today we are coming to you with the presentation of the legislation amending the areas that uh, the court instructed us to address. And as Honorable Mandela is saying, that as the committee does its work, they will also look at what may be other clauses in the legislation that, if not attended, might actually bring us back to court. And we we'll appreciate uh, the engagement and the intervention of the committee in that regard. So I would like to say, with those opening words, uh, Honorable Member Chairperson in particular, we are in your hands in terms of uh, presentation and taking the process forward. Thank you very much. I will go and finish my other meeting, but also rejoin the mm. committee, because I don't think the other meeting will take longer. Thank you, Honorable uh, Minister, for your input. And uh, we will uh, now hand over to the officials of the department, uh, probably as led by the DG, to uh, proceed uh, with the presentation. Thank you, Chair, and uh, honorable members. Uh, Advocate uh, Silo Ramasala is going to take us, take the committee through the, the presentation and the proposed amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, DG. Good afternoon to the honorable chair, honorable members. 
Honorable Minister, Honorable DMs, the DG, and uh, and colleagues. On the on the presentation, starting with the outline, which is fairly brief because the bill itself is also a brief. It is only for uh, clauses. Uh, starting with the introduction, which lays down the background information on what the principal act provides for and what the bill seeks to achieve. We also deal with the two constitutional court cases that has led us to where we are now that has uh, necessitated the provisions of the bill. And then we deal with the with the affected sections of the principal act that required to be amended and then uh, closing remarks in terms of uh, what the department is busy with currently, much of which has been said by the Honorable Minister. The introduction, Honorable Chair, the ULTRA Act, as we call it, uh, provides for a number of things, but in the main, it deals with uh, two types of, of land rights. In the main, those that uh, apply in our criminal areas and those that uh, apply in the so called black townships. In the main, the Act provides for the opening of township registers. It's only three sections uh, in the principal Act that deal with uh, communal land rights uh, Section 3, Section 19, and Section 20. The rest of the principal act deals with uh, with uh, the township uh, registers, opening of them, and rights that obtain in that in that regard. What it also does is uh, as uh, we can I proceed, Chair? In respect of communal you're not audible. Uh, can we please ensure that uh, we mute our mics and uh, only allow the person uh, on the platform uh, to be able to be audible? And please switch on uh, your video so as to we can be able to follow the presentation uh, if it can be uploaded. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. The, the pr principal act specifically provides for the upgrading of uh, certain land rights, which are stated in the two schedules to the principal act. Um, when okay, the, sir, uh, to come in again, the presentation is not uh, loaded, uh, so we not follow uh, in terms of your presentation. Can we ask uh, someone at uh, IT or within the department who's responsible for uh, uploading the presentation to please ensure that we can be able to follow? So Point of order, Chair. Sir? Chair, we can actually see the presentation. Maybe there are the I can also see it. Oh, you can see it, honorable members. Yes. Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. Okay. Now then, uh, if that is, I will try and see on my side as to what has led to. Uh, OK, please proceed. Thank you, Honorable Chair. As I was, I was indicating, the, the Principal Act also provides for the, for the upgrading of, of the rights that are listed in the two schedules to, to the Act itself. And when the act was passed in 1991, um, as it would have been expected, it did not apply to the former TBVC uh, territories. And um, even when it was uh, subsequently made to apply to those areas in 1998, uh, the sections that uh, deal with communal land were excluded from the application of the Act for the Republic. Those are the sections that I've indicated, which is sections 3, section 19, section 20. The 
as I've indicated, the 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 section 25A is the one that uh, indicated that uh, the three sections are not applicable throughout the throughout the republic. Now, on the on the Rahuwe matter, which is the first matter that uh, led to the section two of the Act being declared unconstitutional, dealt with the upgrading of uh, deeds of grant which is done in terms of section two of the principal act uh, where the the section provides for the automatic conversion of a deed of grant which is the type of rights that are held by uh, uh, in respect of township uh, uh, stands or ervan uh, what the court found was that um, the conversion of of deeds of grant is unconstitutional because the deed of grant itself, uh, members will understand that uh, it's not granted in terms of the Ultra Act. It is granted in terms of a proclamation that is listed in the schedule to the Act itself. So it is the it is the actual effect of the application of the proclamation that led to Section Two be declared unconstitutional which means that uh, on the face of it, if you read section two of the principal act, uh, you will find it difficult to identify something that is uh, discriminatory. But it is the it is the application of that section, uh, which is affected by the manner in which the proclamation was implemented, which was discriminatory because it is the proclamation that uh, provided that uh, only uh, male persons could become the holders of the deed of grant that has led to, to this particular challenge. The court declared the section unconstitutional. That's why we are amending it to provide for what the court has said we should provide for, to ensure that uh, there is protection of women in particular. The, the second case is the case relating to the permission to occupy. Uh, which is a right that is um, uh, applicable in the main and communal areas, uh, where a Teba Property Trust, uh, which was a holder of a permission to occupy right in the Joe Gavi district in the Eastern Cape, applied to have that permission to occupy converted into ownership in terms of Section 3 of the Ultra Act. Consequently, the municipality uh, rejected the application for conversion on the basis that um, Section 3 uh, is not applicable in the Eastern Cape part that was the former Transcar. Um, as I've indicated, that uh, in terms of Section 25A, the Principal Act, Sections 3, Section 9 and 20 are not applicable throughout the Republic. Uh, now, ordinarily, the Teba Trust approached the court and uh, claimed that uh, the non-applicability of Section 3 to the part that concerned the transcar uh, in the past was unconstitutional in that uh, it violated a Teba's right to equality, uh, the right to equal protection of the law, as well, and the court agreed with the with Teba and then uh, ordered that um, uh, that section be clear and constant on the basis that uh, it does not apply throughout the republic. Basically, those are the are the are the are the court cases that has led to to a review of of the of the Ultra Act. Now, which basically means that the sections that that are affected by the constitutional court cases. It's section two that uh, provides for the deeds of grant. Then um, we uh, also have amended uh, uh, section four with just a consequential amendment. And then uh, section 14a is inserted to give effect to the court order. And then section 25a, as I've just explained, to make uh, the whole act uh, apply throughout the, the Republic. The way we, we are amending the, the, the Act, the way the bill 
is, is framed with regard to section two is that uh, what the court has said uh, in declaring it unconstitutional is that uh, because it is a is an automatic conversion, it does not uh, allow interested persons to object to the conversions. Um, and then um, therefore we must find a mechanism uh, that uh, provides for interested persons who may wish to object to the conversions to object to the conversions. Uh, so at clause um, one of the bill seeks to do, which, which amends section two of the principal act, is to provide that uh, instead of the conversions occurring automatically, persons who wish to convert the deeds of grant will apply to the minister for the conversion of the deeds of grants. And uh, once an application is reviewed by the minister, the minister will publish such an application in the government gazette to notify interested persons who may wish to object to the conversion to do so. And uh, once the uh, publication is made, and once any other person who is interested uh, objects to the conversion, the minister will probably uh, institute an inquiry to determine the facts around the application and the objection with a view to make a determination as to who is the legitimate holder of the deed of grant. And on the basis of that, um, the application will either uh, succeed for a conversion or having taken into account the objections, if are found to be uh, legitimate, um, then a determination will be made as to who is the rightful holder of that particular deed of grant. Um, that is the that is the the process that we are introducing uh, in the bill, and then uh, which deals with ensuring that um, the conversion is no longer automatic as provided for in the principal act that. Provision is made for persons to object if they wish to, to object. Uh, clause um, uh, three of the bill inserts uh, uh, a new section 14a. Uh, as I've indicated, this uh, is, is an insertion that simply gives effect to the court order, uh, which uh, indicates that, uh, that uh, conversions that have taken place in the past in terms of the act that were uh, uh, which occurred in good faith should be uh, allowed to continue. And uh, those that also you know, took place in favor of women should be allowed to, to stand, uh, basically not to undo conventions that could have taken place in good faith and in favor, in favor of women. And also to, to indicate that uh, uh, persons who may have been prejudiced in the past by, by conventions which discriminate against them are free to, to approach the courts with a view to, to challenge those conventions uh, and, and getting appropriate relief. Then that takes us to, to the last section, Honorable Chair, which is section 25A that I spoke to uh, uh, at length, which is the one that deals with the application of the Act, which had uh, excluded sections uh, 3, section 19, section 20 from uh, being operational in the in the entire in the entire republic. And uh, the bill seeks to, to amend that section and make the entire uh, act apply throughout the republic without uh, without any exception. Um, by way of concluding uh, on the chair as, as the minister has indicated, uh, we are uh, involved in a process of uh, finalizing the communal land tenure bill um, to deal with, uh, I think, what the, the Honorable Chair has indicated in his introductory remarks to, to, to have a full reflection of, of land tenure rights. Uh, maybe I should explain, Honorable Chair, that uh, the, the reason why this re full reflection of, of land tenure rights is happening in the Communal Land Tenure Bill, not in the Ultra Act, is because, uh, as I've indicated, the Ultra Act, if you read it uh, properly, it does not deal substantively with, with these rights. It, it doesn't tell us 
uh, who is eligible for certain rights, who, what is the criteria for the allocation of certain rights. Uh, those substantive matters are dealt with in other laws. Uh, in this instance, if you look at the permission to occupy, they are dealt in the proclamation that, as I've indicated, uh, is uh, is uh, listed in the in the schedule to to the principal act. Uh, the same applies to the deeds of grants that are provided for in section two. Uh, they are also uh, provided substantively in the 1962 uh, proclamation as listed in the in the schedule to the act. So, in other words, it is it is only proper that when a full reflection is done, it is done in terms of um, reviewing those pieces of legislation. Uh, what ALTRA sought to do uh, was simply to, to upgrade those rights as provided for in those other pieces of legislation into ownership rights. And, and that's why even the, the amendment bill is confined to doing just that, dealing with the process itself. As provided for for in ALTRA, uh, that brings me to the end of the pro of the of the presentation, honourable chair and members. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the presentation, honourable members. Uh, there's uh, the presentation uh, from the department uh, on. Uh, ultra bill uh, we may go straight into questions but uh, i'm thinking that uh, we should uh, enable the legal advisor uh, to give us uh, their presentation in terms of uh, uh, the public hearings do we have consensus or would you want to shoot into questions Anyone, honorable members? Chairperson? Yes. Honorable I agree, Chair, that uh, we allow them to take us through that process because it might yes. affect what we want to know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do we have consensus then, honorable members? Honorable uh, State? Yes, Chairperson, I agree. Let us hear from the legal advisors first. I think that okay. they might be able to give us answers. All right. Let us then also invite uh, the uh, legal advisor uh, to give us uh, their presentation so that when we deal with questions, we can deal with both presentations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Chairperson, we have forwarded the legal opinion which we have prepared for uh, all of the committees of Parliament uh, on this question of public participation. Uh, I would just like to check, Chairperson, if members have received a copy uh, of this legal opinion which was specifically uh, provided to the fi Finance Committee uh, portfolio committee, finance portfolio committee, but which sets out what are the legal requirements to conduct effective public education under the circumstances of this COVID-19 lockdown. Would members just assist uh, to confirm if they have they have cop they have received the copies of the opinion, uh, which would uh, assist me in this presentation, chair. Uh, I think uh, with having uh, the uh, department uh, also online and other people that may have not uh, received uh, the presentation, you may go ahead and uh, present it uh, so that we are all together. That is fine. That is fine, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson, our opinion is, is, is actually not uh, very long. It's quite short. Uh, it refers to the rules uh, the, of the National Assembly. It refers also to the Constitution, specifically Section 59, which uh, obligates Parliament to facilitate public involvement in the legislative processes. Uh, 
in, in light of that, Chairperson, there, there has been an established process of public participation, uh, which included uh, uh, public hearings, uh, going out to communities and meeting uh, people in large numbers uh, in order to discharge this uh, constitutional obligation uh, which Parliament has to facilitate public info involvement uh, as, as reasonable and as, as far and wide as possible. Uh, to ensure that the voice of the people is heard uh, in the making of in the making of legislation. However, Chairperson, due to the recent developments uh, of the declaration of the state of disaster, in line with the Disaster Management Act and its regulations, which have set out the lockdown uh, with applicable limitations on the number of people who can gather in one place, uh, this Chairperson has necessitated uh, some changes. Uh, in the manner in which Parliament must dis discharge uh, its constitutional obligation to facilitate public involvement uh, in its legislation making processes. So this change Chairperson, will also be applicable in the instant case uh, in relation to the ultra bill. Uh, the committee will not be able to, as it has always done, be able to con 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 consult people or facilitate public involvement in this very important bill in the manner that it has always done, which is which involves consulting people in large numbers through public hearings uh, and so forth. However, checkers in the rules specifically, it is uh, the rule that's applicable here will be rule, uh, National Assembly Rule number 161 uh, and uh, National Assembly Rule number 43. They provide the necessary uh, flexibility for committees to develop a reasonable mechanism for it to be able to discharge its constitutional obligation of facilitating public involvement within the limitations that are currently uh, underway uh, in terms of the Disaster Management Act. And in this regard, Chairperson, we have, as the support team to your committee, agreed that it would be best to develop a, a with your leave, Chairperson, a draft program uh, for consultation that we would table to you, Chairperson, and the committee to consider uh, uh, in light of the limitations that we have under the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown regulations. That in natural Chairperson is the, is the presentation around this issue of public participation under the current limitations. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, honorable members. There is a the presentation from the legal advisor uh, of parliament. Uh, we may then uh, engage uh, with both presentations and uh, uh, fill your questions. Uh, honorable Kappe. Thanks, uh, Chair. And let me welcome the presentation, Chair. Um, I think this is a, a relief and victory to the women that are vulnerable in this country. That it took Rahube to come up with this process of enforcing government to consider review of this piece of legislation. Two, Chair, is that uh, the legal advisor is not clear as to what are we are expecting as the committee, the process from here. He's talking about what is applicable. We want specifics. If he says to us two teams, three teams, four teams of this committee will go down to provinces or will categorize stakeholders and conduct on, and let it be clear so that we know what is it that we expect. We are the committee, we are the one that must take this forward. Let us know. So it is something that uh, I didn't find uh, any clarity on, on what we asked. I want to also know from the department, now that we are here today, and thanks for acceding to allowing the network process to continue. We are approving what we have done, that is based on what the court ordered. Where do we go from here? Except for public participation, I want to know ex um, more or less the time frame, considering the time it takes for president to accent 
or uh, declare this as a, as a, as a, as a, as an act for how long will it take us? The reason I'm asking this chair is based on the second question of uh, or the following question of uh, the indication that there are other sections that also could still be challenged. If it takes us a year, for an example, for president to sign this off or whatever uh, time, is there an intention within the department to also start a process of reviewing these other sections that are liable to be challenged? Chair, there's also indication from the NetLeg letter that members of community, business and labor were were the people that formulated the tax team that did on one uh, line to line engagement. Key stakeholders in terms of your traditional leadership is not reflected in the process. How is this stakeholder going to be taken on board? How are their views or their submission going to find an expression in what we are doing today? Because my take chair is that up to now, we have done what the, uh, the, the, the court wanted us to do. We approved this is a close matter. It moves forward. We will do public participation. I don't know how are we going to do that. How do we find a way of involving traditional leadership in this one? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, Honorable Tape. Uh, Honorable Marshall. Honorable Marshall. Okay. Uh, Honorable Stein. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you uh, to the presentation. Chair, uh, I just want to find out firstly uh, from the department, except for this uh, to go to uh, NetLAC, did they publish uh, the bill beforehand uh, to get some comments uh, before it was tabled to Parliament? Um, in, and if they did not, uh, why not? Because we had some time even before this um, uh, COVID situation uh, and, and, you know, usually that is the normal processes. Uh, why was that not followed? Then um, I, I also want, Chair, I think from the beginning last year, I asked that we get a presentation by the department on the influence of other legislation and bills on this. Uh, my concern is that we I, I, I hear about the communal land tenure bill. Why did they not write something into uh, this piece of legislation um, that we are, are currently dealing with, that we have another piece of legislation still keep, keeping people living on communal land as separate? I'm, 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 I'm not a constitutional um, 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 legal person. But in my mind, it, we can be challenged again by um, what what the case, uh, the second case um, in 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 um, uh, the Senku one um, that 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 says that uh, all uh, people living in in communal areas must be included. Uh, if, if, if the department can assist me with that, and maybe also our legal advisors can give us some kind of idea, because the last thing that I want, Chairperson, is for us to almost rush through this bill to get it done because of the legal uh, time frame that we are given, just to be taken to court again, uh, because we we did not do basically what, what we were asked to do. Um, uh, then I think that's my questions for now, Chairperson. I think as a portfolio, we will discuss the process that needs to be followed uh, for us now that the bill is with, with this portfolio to ensure that we get um, as much community participation as possible, um, especially uh, the fact that it will have an impact on a lot of people um, everywhere in South Africa. Uh, we need to do our utmost best to, to get uh, community participation. Thank you, Chairperson. 
Thank you, Honorable Tapa. Apologize. Apologize. Thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Matthias. Well, thanks uh, uh, for the opportunity. I I also agree with uh, fellow members that we we need to take a very precautionary approach to this matter. We rather we rather make mistake on the side of caution than to make mis mistake on the on, on the side of expedience. What do I mean? What I mean is instead of us running with the process and later the same process to be questioned or to be declared as unconstitutional and invalid on some of the sections which the department hasn't disclosed to us as yet. Uh, let's rather uh, err on the side of caution than erring on the side of expedition. To proceed would be to act expeditiously, would, uh, would act uh, irresponsibly. And uh, let's try to avoid a knee-jerk reaction. We, we must accept that uh, we should have done something about this piece of legislation, but we didn't do anything until uh, uh, concerned citizens uh, to, to take this matter upon themselves. So that's the first advice. The second advice is, 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 is provided in our jurisprudence that extension can be asked or or a request can be made with the with the courts or even with the constitutional court to grant us extension, taking in account the circumstances we find ourselves of the COVID-19, which limits Parliament to carry out areas of its functions and responsibilities, such as public participation and so forth and so on. Let's make a formal request to the Constitutional Court or to the High Court to grant us permission for about another 12 months uh, with the hope that within that 12 months period, uh, we would not be struggling with the COVID-19. I'm, I'm afraid that if we proceed, uh, we might uh, have to live with the take on our face where we're told that the same work that we have done, we have to repeat it again and again and again. Let's err on the side of caution rather than to err on the side of being expeditious. Thanks so much. Thank you, Honorable Matthias. Um, Honorable um, Babama. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I agree with the three um, members who have spoken thus far. And uh, in terms of getting an extension or asking for an extension from the Constitutional Court, I think it would be wise for the department first to uh, plot a way forward with dates, with a timeline, so that when they do go to the Constitutional Court, at least they have a timeline to say this will happen, especially because they are telling us that there are other legislations that will uh, affect, that also might need to be amended, that will affect this one. So my recommendation is that there is a timeline from the department, which will be obviously uh, presented to us. We will look at it and agree, and then ask for, a, for, a, for an extension from the Constitutional Court. But rushing into, into the, this, you know, trying to finish everything by, the, by, by April 2021 is not going to do a proper job. So I agree with the past three speakers. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Mabriet. Hi, Chairperson. Sorry I was a bit late. Um, we had the youth parliament, but Chairperson, thank you. Um, I will also be short. Um, I would um, 
like to agree with my four with the four previous speakers. My initial fear um, regarding regarding ultra was the fact that the department indicated that some of the other legislation that was not necessarily on the table to change now can also be found to be unconstitutional um, and that they were not focusing on that. Um, and my great fear as well is in terms of of these other un unconstitutional parts that if we wait for another court case and then have to revise it, we're actually being more cumbersome. And at the end of the day, we are not bringing our property rights to our people and we are, you know, we are, are just burdened the department with even more money um, um, in terms of public participation and in terms of rewriting and rewriting and rewriting as the, you know the same law um, so I would I would agree with them and that maybe is just my comment in terms of that I would agree that with honorable Mbabama that we should approach the constitutional court that they should have clear time frames and that we can properly plan ultra because at the end of the day um rushing a bill and then just to find ourselves in a year or two or three or maybe the seventh parliament right back at this stage um i think is is um counterproductive at all and chairperson that is that is all from me just my comment thank you honorable Treder. Honorable Trader might still seem to be uh, like Honorable Briet uh, in uh, Youth Parliament, but it should be attended by now. Honorable Mathati. Honorable Mathati. Chairperson, um, I can maybe, I'm maybe out of order, but I did see her when I exited the youth parliament that she was still there. Um, I think okay. we have run a bit late with a bunch of point of orders, so I think that is where they've been held up. I was fortunate to be be virtual there. Thank you, Honorable Briet. Let's move on then to Honorable Masipa. My video is not working. Can you hear me? Yes, Can you hear me, Chair? Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I think a, a number of areas have been covered by my colleagues, but I think the other area that I think may perhaps you know the department can uh, look at is um, you know engaging other various departments you know in terms of their input. But also, like um, Honorable Mbabama indicated, that uh, let's uh, ask extension to make sure that we do a proper work. I agree with that fully. I think let's do that because otherwise we're going to do a rush work, and it's not going to really sit well if the bill is returned back and we got uh, legal um, challenges in the process. Uh, that's my input, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you. There any other honourable member have left out? No, Chair. Honorable. Thanks, Chair. I think the honourable other members are, have not logged in. I don't know what's the problem with honourable members. But Chair, I just want to correct something. Mary, the submissions that has been made, and I'm taking cue from what Honorable Masipa has just indicated. Chair, I said earlier on, we are at this stage where we need to say, this is what the court has ordered us to do. It is done. Chair, I agree with Honorable Masipa that we can't return this bill where it is. My take, Chair, is that as and when this was brought before us last year, we missed an opportunity to say, despite these other sections that the court has identified, the Rahupia case, the single case, there are other sections that can equally be challenged. Now, the work has been focusing on these sections only, and this is the process that has brought us where we are today. The department is equally saying to us, there are other sections that can equally be challenged. Hence, I said, when we conclude this one, is there an intention also to address these others? So what I'm saying, Chair, is that 
let's wrap this one up so that the extension we required doesn't say to the courts we don't know what we are doing we requested them extension is granted now we want to repeal the whole legislation we have seen the loopholes according to the department let's continue with public participation include stakeholders that are not represented on the network processes i made an example of the traditional how the house of traditional leaders nothing stops us to say how do we sample traditional leadership they've got houses they have provincial houses if we give them adequate time to do submission during our public processes that will be according to the covert regulations they will come to the party business was part community according to netlec was part labor was part other departments has been cited so my plea chair and my take is that we are at what the court ordered let's proceed and conclude it but we know for sure that this department has been saying to us there are communal tenure legislations that they are busy with how are they roving in these other sections that can be challenged so that we close that loopholes so i agree with honorable masipa and with honorable mbabama which i said initially let them give us the time frames of concluding on this one so that we don't find ourselves wanting with the extension that we ask from the courts thanks chair thank you honorable clapper seems uh, that uh, honorable marshal has been able to join us you have a question uh, honorable marshal any other member honorable members that i have not recognized chair you have uh, recognized me but may yeah. i say something my hand is raised electronically okay please go I, thank you uh, chair honorable mbabama thank you chair um our advocate jengane um said something about the uh, about them presenting a draft program for consultation under covid uh that he would present i think it's presented it to other committees or he is going to present it i've gone to my email i can't find anything to that effect can he not give us a brief summary of what it suggests so that uh, when we do even when the department themselves uh, plan the timelines and the time frame time frames for these um, for this legislation so that they can know what kind of process and how long it would actually take for the public participation thank you chair thank you honorable uh, mamu babama honorable chair, members uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to also sponsor questions before we hand back to the department and the legal advisor uh, want to uh, welcome the presentations that have been put uh, to us but uh, i would like to ascertain from the input made uh, by the department what are the implica uh, the implications in terms of capacity of the department to process applications timely uh, does the department uh, have adequate staff to attend to this and uh, the socio economic impact assessment report and funding implications must be submitted to the committee uh, therefore i'd like to understand uh, from the department why are they not included in this presentation what are the sections in the ultra bill that may be found unconstitutional can you highlight those for the committee and uh, also in terms of uh, the court uh, uh, is finding it says that the order is retrospective since the 27th of april in 1994 what does this actually mean 
and how many people may be affected by this. I would suggest that, uh, honorable members, uh, we comply with the Concord order. The timeline should be a should be for a comprehensive legislation and therefore believe that uh, we should be able to engage uh, with uh, the uh, the bill as uh, requested uh, by the uh, concord and we can therefore be able to look at uh, the timeline in that respect and I think uh, I would uh, also uh, want to ascertain, like Honorable Cup, in terms of uh, the National House of Traditional Leaders, as well as the Provincial House of Traditional Leaders, what the concerns of traditional leaders have been regarding the bill, and have those been taken into consideration? But also when you're looking at uh, the communal land rights uh, uh, tenure, uh, what uh, would uh, the uh, issues emanating from that uh, uh, have an effect on this current bill? If you can be able to uh, take us through that. Thank you. Let us, uh, honorable members, uh, hand back to the department then we will also hear from uh, the legal advisor's input. DG, you may proceed. Chair, um, I, I thought the minister had rejoined the meeting. Uh, I was going to leave some of the questions to the minister, but on the technical aspects, one uh, who advocates Silver Masara will deal with the 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 implications the 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 regulatory impact assessment or the CS uh, issue um, the implications of implementing this bill uh, we were asked at some point to do a full determination uh, of how many individuals in different parts of the country where this legislation uh, is applicable would be affected. Uh, I think that's a very difficult one to, 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 to determine. Um, the, the issue of capacity, Chairperson, one can never say that a department has got all the capacity that is required to, to implement uh, the, this particular legislation. Um, obviously, it will require the department to re to revise its own plan, to revise uh, its uh, its uh, it, how it allocates the, the the resources that are available at, at its disposal. But also, it will also be up to the minister to determine whether uh, some of the sections in terms of the administration of the application should necessarily be done at a national level or whether the minister can delegate some functions uh, to other spheres of government. I don't, I, those discussions we have not held. Chairperson, the, 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 the bigger one is that you are raising and other members, uh, particularly honorable state. I think the difficulty of not combining uh, the work that has been done in terms of uh, uh, the, the communal land rights bill and this particular legislation, I think there are two fundamental uh, issues uh, between the two. The, 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 the big one uh, coming in terms of the communal land rights, the, the first is the determination in terms of who are the rights holders of the land that is currently communal, uh, communally owned. You recall that the constitutional judgment when we, we when we went we came to parliament with Clara and which subsequently was uh, uh, um, uh, was found to be unconstitutional, was that we at that time uh, we were uh, we wanted to create structures that would uh, uh, transfer the land the outside boundaries of communal land in totality to new structures and the court said 
No, you are creating a sphere of government that is not provided for in the constitution. In the constitution, the difference between that and what Ultra seeks to do is that Ultra begins even within an area of a traditional council where there could be a township that could have been created where deeds of grants were given to people, as is the case in many former homelands in other former RSA townships. There were people who were given deeds of grants. Uh, there were people who were given, uh, even deeds of grants were upgraded to full title in many parts of KZN, and we know that for a fact. The difference here is that ALTRA begin to deal with the rights at the level of a household, not at the level of a jurisdiction of a traditional council. So, so, so the processes of dealing with those two are, are different in that sense. Hence, there has got to be two different pieces of legislation. There is a relationship, but the other one deals with the bigger issues. But I will ask uh, uh, Advocate Silo Ramasala on, on, on the, the other section that the members are asking uh, about, which could be deemed to be unconstitutional in the current ultra bill. Thank you, thank you, DJ, and thank you, Honorable Chair. Maybe starting with with that, the if if we look at the Principal Act, uh, Section Two deals with the upgrading of deeds of grants. Section Three deals with the upgrading of permission to occupy uh, certificates. The process is more or less the same of of conversion of the two types of land rights. Now, only section two has been challenged uh, by Rahuwe because he was the holder, or it was with regard to the holder of a deed of grant. We have not had a challenge on section three that deals with the conversion of a permission to occupy into ownership. Uh, it could be that we have not had conversions in this respect. Maybe that's why there has not been there has not been a challenge. Now, what will definitely be challenged is the process itself, because even in section two, it is the process that was challenged, not so much the content of the right or the nature of the right. It is the process that the the conversion is made by operation of the law automatically, which is the case also with regard to section three. Now, the court has said that um, the automatic conversion does not allow interested persons to object uh, to those conversions. Now, that is section two. Now, section three also is couched in the same terms as section two. That is the section that I'm saying. If it was to be challenged as a process, it would be also on the same basis as section two be found to be unconstitutional. Now, in terms of uh, dealing with the with the with the substantive rights, why we are dealing with 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 section three in legislation that provides for communal land tenure in general is because the principal act, the only sections that deal with communal land tenure is three sections: is section three, section nineteen, section twenty. Now. In the development of communal land legislation, that legislation will ultimately replace Section 3, Section 19, Section 20. Now, we could well have provided for in this amendment bill the amendment of Section 3 to be in line with what we're proposing with regard to Section, section, section 2, basically to correct the process make provision for, for objections, and make provision for an inquiry to determine who's the rightful holder of the right. Uh, but the, the, the advice we got from the chief stakeholder was that we concentrate on the sections that were declared unconstitutional, which section three was not. And the advice was given on the basis of the time frames that the court had given us. In fact, the, the initial draft that we sent to the state law advisor was more extensive than the one that we have. It was it was more broader. Uh, it tried to deal with those other issues as well. But they said, yeah. for these purposes, because you're correcting what the court has already ruled to be unconstitutional, only concentrate 
on the sections that are constitutional, also given the time frames that 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 we have. Now, going straight to to the direct concerns raised by by honourable members, I will try to deal with them um, in the order in which they were raised. Um, uh, I think the the first concerns raised by honourable Clape with regard to how long it will take to finalise the the. I was not sure whether reference is made to, to, to this bill, how long it will take Parliament to finalise the bill, or the question was whether how long it will take the Department to finalise communal land tenure legislation that is that is that is being reviewed currently. Uh, if if the question related to how long it will take Parliament, uh, that that is the Department were not able to 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 determine uh, because the. It is it is parliamentary processes that that will determine how long it will take to 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 finalize the bill. Um, but in our experience, it 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 sometimes it takes quite some time. I mean, we for instance we have the communal we have an amendment to the uh, Communal Property Associations Act that was I think it was just in 2018. It still has not been signed by the president as we speak now as an example. So it is difficult for us to to have a sense of how long it will take. A bill once it's introduced uh, to be to be finalised. If if the question related to how long it will take us to review the communal and tenure legislation, uh, the, the the minister has has made a commitment uh, when we were asked the question by the leader of government business, the deputy president, we have committed to introducing the bill next year in parliament, and we as as we have indicated. We, the bill is, is, is ready from our point of view. We are simply finalizing the consultation process with all the stakeholders that, uh, that are involved uh, in, the, in the process. Uh, and that leads to the next question, whether we have consulted with traditional traditional leaders. On the, on the ultra amendment bill, we have not consulted with, uh, with uh, traditional, traditional leaders. We have not consulted with many stakeholders because we did not even publish the bill for comment because of the time frames that 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 we find ourselves operating within. But as I've indicated on the review of communal land tenure legislation, we are in full consultation with traditional leaders, with COPTA and other uh, interested stakeholders. And that's the point that the minister also made with regard to having uh, conducted uh, uh, tours to understand how other countries are dealing with it. In fact, it's important to note also that in the delegation that, that went to Uganda, to Botswana, we had traditional leaders represented in that delegation uh, of the department. The concerns as raised by the Honorable Stain, did we publish the bill for comment? We did not publish the bill for comment. Um, why not? Basically because of the time frames that, that we find ourselves operating uh, within. Uh, maybe I should indicate what actually happened is that uh, the, the Rahuwe judgment was in October, November 2018, and then uh, the Singhu judgment was, was the following year. And uh, what we did is um, we, we started working on the bill around April 2019. Um, we, we sought uh, uh, legal advice from constitutional uh, experts in terms of how best to to address the issues raised by the constitutional court. Uh, we got an opinion plus minus three months later, uh, which we started to work on. We submitted the initial draft to the chief state law advisor um, around uh, June 2019. Uh, we only got uh, an opinion around November uh, last year. Uh, that's when we started to, to, to finalize the bill with a view to have a table in Parliament. And, and that's the time when we realized that we, we would not make it within the time frames, and that's when we approached uh, uh, the Constitutional Court for an extension, uh, also on the advice of the committee at the time when we made the presentation to the committee. Uh, the other question that Honorable Stain raised or concern was with regard to influence of yeah, yeah, other legislation, other legislation on the on the bill, 
and also in relation to the concerns are raised around, I think the status of, of people still staying in in traditional traditional areas. As 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 we have indicated, um, we 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 are done almost with with a review of legislation related to communal land. Um, and that is ready. We'll be tabling it if everything uh, goes well in Parliament next year. Um, and like like the minister has indicated, this will not be the first attempt of the department to do that. Um, our first attempt was in 2000 and 2004 when we put Clara together, uh, but was unfortunately declined, as the DGS also indicated in 2009, and that's when we we were also assist with the with the with the task of reviewing it um the concerns raised by honorable matthias um the sections that that have not been disclosed as possibly being unconstitutional as i've indicated it's section three in particular which deals with uh, with uh, a conversions of permission to occupy uh, it is suspect because it's a it's a process a provision like section two. It is the process that will be challenged, not so much the content of of that of that of the substance of that particular section. Uh, like I've indicated, the the substantive challenges are in the actual legislation, which uh, ALTRA seeks to give effect to, which is a legislation that is in the in the in the schedules to the act, in the form of proclamations. Yeah, which is the one that that I'm saying with regard to communal land tenure is the one that we are currently reviewing, uh, and in particular this will be a proclamation R188 of 1969 is the one that deals with permission to occupy, and the one that deals with section three, section 19, and section 20. The deed of grant is in respect of proclamation 293 of 1962, which is also listed in the ALTRA Act that provides for deeds of grants. <clears throat> the concerns raised by Honorable Mbapama um, of, of possibly seek going to the Council Court to see, seek an extension. I, I, I thought the or understood the question to be relating to, to Parliament or the committee or going to court to, to seek an extension in terms of how the committee is going to be engaging its public hearings process uh, going further. Um, because I did not understand that to mean the department going back to court, because we've been to court to ask for an extension already, we've been granted an extension. And then if it has to be uh, the department that does the gain, it will mean that maybe the bill has to be withdrawn to be with the department again, because where the bill is now, the department has no, has no uh, direct control in terms of how parliament proceeds with it. Um, Concerns raised by Honorable Briet. Um, uh, okay, also the question was what, which possible sections are, are suspect? I've indicated section three. And then she also, um, you know, what, what, what other laws we're working on to, to bring them in line with, with what the question is. As I've indicated, is the Communal Land Tenure Bill that we're working on that will deal with with the communal land tenure rights uh, in 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 comprehensively uh, to ensure that that they are they are properly addressed. Honourable Masipa, uh, I think also spoke about the extension. As I understand it, it is the extension that that Parliament may or the committee may may seek to be able to process the bill uh, if it relates to us going the department going back to court. As I've said, we've already been to court, we've been given extension. We can only go back to court again on the bill if the bill is drawn, which is not what I think the, the committee is, is proposing we, we do. Um, again, Honorable Clapper, um, I also wanted to know about the time frames for, for communal land tenure legislation that are developing. As I've indicated, we have committed to have the bill tabled in Parliament next year. Um, the I think there were also uh, concerns raised by the Honourable Chair in in closing, um, some of which the DG has has responded to. 
the issues of, of capacity, uh, the DGS has discussed that. The issue of, of the SEAS, uh, what I'm aware is that uh, we, we, we got a preliminary SEAS report, uh, and I'm sure we, 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 can, we can make that available to the committee. Um, but uh, the, the SEAS report did not, and, and will also not be able to, to answer the question of, of, uh, of uh, how many how many people are affected by 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 the by the by the bill or by the constitutional court decision um, as the DGS indicated we we checked with the DIS office uh, to to indicate to us uh, if the the information from the date of commencement of the ALTRA Act, uh, how many conversions have they had, in particular uh, around section two that deals with the deeds of grant. Uh, they told us that they, 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 they do not have a way of telling us how many conversions they've had. And, and the way they explained it, it, it made sense, because what happens is that uh, the conversions were not necessarily happening as and when individuals approached the DIS office to convert. Uh, if you look at the, the, the manner in which Section 2 is, is crafted in the Ultra Act, it, it says that the conversion occurs by operation of the law. Uh, in other words, as and when a township register is opened, uh, people who are the holders of certain, of the deeds of grants in particular, automatically became uh, title holders, they became owners. In some instances, the individuals would, when they approach the DIS office, to note certain transactions that they would confirm the conversion. So as a result of that, they, they do not have the figures that they can tell us. Um, you know, this, these are the actual figures. But if you, if you look at the number of townships that, that could be involved throughout South Africa, uh, it, 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 it must be an enormous um, uh, uh, task to, to determine that. Uh, and maybe also going to the issue of, 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 the, of the capacity. The reason why I suspect the, the act is couched in the manner it is couched, that the conversions were by operation of the law, that the conversions were automatic, was to avoid a situation where individuals would approach the DIS office to do automatic or individual conversions. Because Parliament could have realized that it was going to be an enormous time in terms of capacity, in terms of the resources that would be required. Now, now the court has said that must happen uh, uh, because it must provide for an opportunity for people to object, because if it does not, it's unconstitutional on the basis that, that the court found it to be unconstitutional. Um, the Honourable Chair also asked about the particular section uh, that is suspect. I have indicated that is Section 3, and also to reiterate that uh, it is with regard to the process itself, not so much the content of, of the right. <clears throat> the, the other concern raised was what is meant by the retrospective application of the court order, if I can put it that way, up to 1994. Well, I think that that's a practical uh, consideration by the court, that uh, if the court is going to be declaring uh, Section 2 unconstitutional, uh, it, it must say something about conversions that took place already. And the court has said that uh, those that uh, took place in good faith, in favor of women, must be allowed to stand. Uh, and those that uh, are standing, if any person has got uh, 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 challenges with them, uh, people object to them, people are free to approach the court for appropriate relief. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consequential or practical arrangement that the court has to come up with uh, to ensure that uh, what happened in the past is, is duly uh, corrected. Uh, the last points I think raised by the Honorable Chair with regard to traditional, traditional uh, leaders, their concerns uh, were they considered. Um, 
the issues between communal and tenability that working on and, and this particular beam. As, as, as we have indicated, we, we have not directly consulted with traditional leaders on the bill. Firstly, because it was not published for comment, uh, but we, we, we continue to engage with them on the provisions of the bill that relate to communal land tenure through the communal land tenure uh, bill development process. And, and to answer directly what are the issues in the communal land tenure bill affecting this particular bill is that, uh, as I've indicated, the, the only sections of the Ultra Principal Act that deals that deal with communal land tenure, Section 3, which provides for the process, Section 19, that uh, provides that a traditional community uh, is a legal entity that can acquire and hold property in, in its name, and, and the Section 20, that provides that the minister uh, may transfer communal land to a traditional community. Now, those are the sections that only um, deal with, those are the only sections that deal with uh, communal, communal land. And these are the sections that when we, when we finalize, that the sections that in the current communal land tenure bill that, that we're providing for, those matters are provided for in that act. The act deals, the bill deals with transfer of communal land to communities. The bill also provides for the uh, uh, creation of communities as legal entities to hold land in their own right. And then also the, the bill provides for the conversion, if you like, of, of permission to occupy and other forms of, 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 of land rights uh, into 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 ownership, basically to be owned by the community itself and the community to, de to determine uh, further rights that that it it uh, it uh, it allocates to community members, whether it be ownership, whether it be uh, a right to use, whether it it, it is lease, uh, and also maybe to in in conclusion to also indicate that the communal land tenure bill. Will also deal with 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 the land that is currently uh, vesting under the Ngonyama Trust because it's part of communal communal land that that uh, must form uh, the basis of of uniform system that that the state is creating relating to communal land tenure in general. Honourable Chair, I think that that was an attempt to deal with all the concerns raised. I hope that I've been able to to address them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we have a response uh, from the parliamentary legal advisor. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chair, I will start with the issue of the consultation of traditional leadership. Uh, we prepared a legal opinion, Chairperson, for the joint standing, uh, for the joint tagging mechanism which is the Committee of Parliament that decides the procedure of the Constitution in terms of which this bill must be processed. Our advice to the joint taking mechanism was that the bill must be processed in, term, be processed in terms of Section 76 of the Constitution because it affected the administration of law in the provinces in a substantial measure. That is in line with the Tongwane Constitutional Court judgment on the decision to dis, on, on, on the decision on procedure in terms of which legislation must be processed in Parliament. So we advise the Section 76 procedure. In that same opinion to the joint taking mechanism, Chairperson, we advised that the matter be referred to the National House of Traditional Leadership because the contents of the bill deal with matters that fall under the jurisdiction of, 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 of traditional leadership and they also affect customary law. In that respect, Chairperson, the joint taking mechanism agreed firstly with the advice on the procedure in terms of which to process the bill, and also the advice in terms of referring this bill as introduced to the National House of Traditional Leadership for comment. So to that extent, Chairperson, we can reasonably say that the traditional leadership has been consulted in this regard, at least in the manner in which we had advised that 
uh, the bill must be referred to the to that specific house for for its comment on the contents of the bill. Moving on to the issue of the approach to amendment, uh, Chairperson, to to the amendment of of this ultra bill. Uh, oh, sorry, the amendment of the ultra act. The, the legal advisor or advocate Ramasala from the department, Chairperson, has mentioned. In his presentation, he presented on the bill that is currently before the committee, which is the bill that seeks to amend the principal act to give effect only to the two constitutional court judgments, which is the Senko decision as well as the one on Rafa. This bill, as before the committee now, Chairperson, only confines itself to those two decisions. So it's a technical bill which gives effect to a constitutional court decision. But in his presentation, he correctly referred it to other proposed legislation that the department is still working on, which will have an effect on the ultra bill, on the ultra, on the on the act itself, the principal act. And he related that to these two provisions, which are technical that are currently before the committee now. And I think Chairperson, that may have led to the understanding that there might be some level of unconstitutionality in what the committee is currently doing now. And in, to that extent, Chairperson, if I'm correct in my understanding, I would like to just state it quite categorically that what the committee is currently dealing with now is a technical, is, a, is, a, is an issue of passing legislation or at least processing legislation which deals with the technical issues of bringing the legislation in line with the two constitutional court judgments in the Senko and the Rahube decisions. And then, Chairperson, I move on to the issue of the extensions, which have been the extension that has been granted by the constitutional court for the time period within which parliament must pass this legislation. In this regard, Chairperson, I'd like to mention to the committee that as we had seen when the committee decided that the constitutional court must be approached to extend the time period to pass the, the, the restitution of land rights amendment bill, the court declined that application and stated very clearly that extensions in the constitutional court are granted very reluctantly and only in instances where, in the opinion of the court, it would serve the, the, the principle of being just and equitable to, to grant such an extension. Even in this instance case, Chairperson, where the committee advised the department to approach the Constitutional Court for, for a decision to extend the time period to pass this legislation, the court granted this extension, extension reluctantly, but was persuaded by the reasons which were forwarded, uh, that it would be in the interest of justice to give this extension to allow Parliament to give effect to the two constitutional court decisions, which is the Senko and, 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 and the Rahobe judgment, that being just a technical amendment. So, the, so any, any, any uh, extension over and above the one that's already been granted, Chairperson, uh, the court would be very reluctant to grant uh, in light of uh, other and previous... In, in light of, of previous court decisions, Chairperson, where the court has expressly rejected Parliament's applications for extension, and we count about four uh, judgments of the Constitutional Court, Chairperson, where the court has declined uh, an application by Parliament to to give an extension to pass the time period, to sorry to to uh, time, extend the time period to finish to pass the legislation. So, so I just wanted to mention, Chairperson, that. We, 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 there is a possibility of uh, not succeeding in the event that the committee uh, wanted to approach the constitutional court to, to, to extend its uh, time period within which to pass this technical amendment, which only deals with the two uh, decisions of the constitutional court. Uh, Chairperson, I just want to also move on to the other key issue that the committee has spoken about, which is the issue of, of public participation as a constitutional requirement and relate that issue to the decision of the Constitutional Court, a key decision of the Constitutional Court relating to the standard of public participation, which Parliament must uh, adhere to uh, when it's facilitating public involvement. 
It's Section 59 of the Constitution, which uh, sets out the obligation on Parliament to facilitate public involvement. It's the Doctors for Life decision of the Constitutional Court, which analyzes the, the, the application of that section, 20, section 59 of the Constitution. And in principle, the court said it is the discretion of Parliament. It is, it is the discretion of Parliament to decide what it should do to discharge its obligation in terms of Section 59. But that discretion must be reasonable and it must meaningfully allow an opportunity for the public to participate in the legislation making process. So the court did not did not declare what the procedure should be or did not prescribe what the procedure should be. So it remains a decision of, of, of specific committees to look at the legislation that is before them, to look at its significance and decide that within the rules that are applicable to facilitate public involvement, what is it that the committee considers to be reasonable facilitation of public participation uh, in, in, in the processing of that particular legislation? I say so, Chairperson, in light of the, of the limitations which the committee is experiencing now under COVID-19, uh, which are also being experienced by various other committees that are considering legislation. This question came up, Chairperson, just by way of reference. This question came up in the, in the, in the, in the finance committees, uh, where they had to quickly uh, facilitate public involvement before they passed the, the finance uh, bills before, before those committees. And Chairperson, I can mention here that the media platforms were used by those committees to facilitate public involvement. Those included virtual meetings, written submissions, as means of giving an opportunity for the public to participate in the processing of the bills. So under COVID-19, committees have been using virtual means as well as written submissions to facilitate public involvement. However, Chairperson, that being said, I note that it may not be applicable in this instance, or the committee might not be satisfied with those two uh, mechanisms that have been used in the past by other committees under the, under the circumstances to facilitate public involvement. But it remains in the discretion of the committee to consider what is reasonable to facilitate public involvement within the circumstances. This is where Chairperson I said, understanding the principle of reasonable facilitation as said in the, in the Doctors for Life judgment, we, we, would, we as support to the committee would sit and come up with a draft plan that we would present to the committee to consider, which, in, which states what mechanisms the committee could use to achieve uh, its objective of facilitating public involvement under the circumstances of COVID-19 and the lockdown regulations. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the state of disaster in terms of the Disaster Management Act. So also moving from that, Chairperson. Can uh, you conclude? Oh, yes, Chairperson, sorry, please forgive me. Uh, as I conclude, uh, I just wanted to also say, Chairperson, that when the bill is published for public comment, we, the committee will have an opportunity to gauge the public interest from that publication. And that response will also provide an, an opportunity for the committee to see which of the mechanisms that are available in terms of the rules can be employed under the circumstances for the committee to try and achieve public participation. So, so though that is just the, the few things that I, I wanted to mention, Chairperson. Otherwise, the rest, my colleague from the department has, has covered, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. There you have uh, the responses, uh, both from the department and uh, the parliamentary uh, legal advisor. Is any follow up questions? And if Honorable any, Stein, can we keep them sharper. All right. Honorable Stein, keep it short, please, so that we can be able to attend to the other matters of the committee. I will try, Chairperson. 
Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much uh, for the comments. I think it is it is clear now exactly uh, what what is expected of us. Chair, I, I want to make a comment uh, on something that Honourable Klape said, and I want to disagree with her. I remember the day when we discussed uh, the Constitutional Court, uh, uh, um, uh, not during the, the outcome of the court case of, of specifically Raube. That was the one that was brought before this committee. And I said at that meeting that I'm aware of another case, the one of uh, Sentut and others uh, before them and after them where sections of the uh, of, of current land legislation has been found unconstitutional. Like, for instance, the Clara one that was already found unconstitutional in 2010. And I asked the department specifically to look at all of the legislation and all of the legal cases that were currently in court and that already were found constitutional so that when we deal with things, we can deal with one slew of legislation. We don't have all of this pieces and pieces and pieces and pieces and pieces coming to us uh, because we need to, at one or other stage, get the land legislation under one piece of legislation that can comply to the constitution. We cannot constantly have people living in communal land under a separate system than people on other land, and we need to get to some kind of point. So I, 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 I want to disagree with with uh, the, my honourable colleague, and I, I don't want us to have that a fight, but I, I want to get that off my chest. Chairperson, the, the next thing is, I want to also, for that same reason, say to the department that I'm unhappy with them, because the fact that it was just brought to this committee Without first publish, publishing it for public comment, it could have given us some kind of idea that they will only deal with that two sections where the court has now told them to deal with it and not revise the whole section. If you were busy with Clara at that stage, already that uh, I'm now told is almost finalized, why could we not have done it in one go and get people under the same piece of legislation, which is our constitution, so that everyone in this country live under the same constitutional right. I'm really not happy uh, with that, Chairperson. And then um, I, I know once a piece of legislation has been tabled, we must only deal with that that we are told. So this portfolio committee, our hands is now tied we need to deal with the sections that the court told us to deal with. That's fine. We will proceed, but I will make it clear that people will know that this government under this department has decided that it stole people when Clara was found under unconstitutional in 2010 already. We'll still deal with people separately. I'm not happy, Chapers. And I would like to find out from DG Shabane. He said, if I uh, heard him correct, that certain people in KZN under communal uh, areas were already given uh, an upgrade to their land rights and were given land um, uh, um, title to their land. I would like to know what piece of legislation was used in KZN and how many such cases do we have so that we can know why people are being treated differently in different areas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Stain. Let us remind you we are a non-violent uh, committee and I would not want you to see you carry a fight to Honorable Clap. So please let's uh, uh, ensure that we illustrate to South Africans that we uh, take uh, heed <laughs> to the call uh, to from the president to curb violence. So, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not I, I, I'm angry with the honourable club. I'm angry with the department. All right, honourable Mbabama. Trump. 
Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I think my my comment as well uh, is close to what Honourable Stain is saying. And I, I think you will allow me to say it in my language so that I am very clear. challenges from the ground now. For Rubasibo Nuba legislation irongo. Okanye, it is not according to the to the to the constitution. And Mnage, I don't know, maybe I, I you forgive my, my ignorance if I'm ignorant, Che. But do we really have to wait for challenges to change the section three and all of that? I'm a little bit confused as to the process. We fix what the constitutional uh, 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 court has said we must fix, and then what happens thereafter? What about the areas that we can see, that we can now see that need uh, uh, amendment as well? Are we going to start afresh again? I would really uh, uh, appreciate it if uh, both advocates could just, uh, you know, make things clearer for me because I, I'm really at a loss. Thank you. Honorable Kaber. Thanks, Chair. Chair, we will never fight, at least with my colleague, Honorable Stain. Maybe sometimes I know I speak a bit fast. And it will be prudent upon me, Chair, to say what I said initially. Honorable Mbabama has just said, now that we know. I initially said, Chair, we're dealing with sections that has been declared invalid. Oh. And when we requested extension or advised the department to seek extension, we missed an opportunity to say there are other sections that could equally be challenged. Otherwise, we could have said, let's repeal the whole legislation. But we focused on the two sections. Hence, I said, let's agree to wrap up in compliance of the court order and make sure that we await this process here, communal land tenure, that I ask, how far is the review? How long will it take? Now, that is still what is saying to us, Advocate Silo, Section 3, Section 19, Section 20 of this principal act, that we we saying can equally be challenged has got a bearing on the what they are doing regarding communal rights. Yes, Clara was scrapped. Now there's a review on the other side that is being done. Hence, it is being said to us: let's await this process and see how Section Three that can be challenged get addressed through this other process here, communal rights. Now, Chair, I want us to agree that once this has been tabled, the bill tabled in Parliament, it cannot go back. It's upon us as the committee to take the process forward. Hence, I agree with Honorable Stain now to say, let's forge forward with this process. Develop a program. Our Parliament's legal advisor is saying they will draft something that we can consider within the confines of the regulations that lock down. So let's forge forward. We'll await this draft, input on it, and find a program and agree on a program of hastening this within the extension and making sure that we close it up. But on the sidelines, we will watch and monitor the process of communal rights, review process, all those other legislations, particularly on this section three that we left unattended to. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Masipa. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. We can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, Chair, I think I just want to register my um, uh, unhappiness with regards to the, um, the, as I listen to the advocate, basically and technically is that the bill is now dumped on us. We need to sort our way forward. And I think uh, my concern is that, you know, they had enough time with the department to publish this bill for public comments and make sure that we don't get into this stage. 
but I think I agree with the suggestion that has been made by Chape, but I thought it's important, Chair, just to register this concern uh, uh, with you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, honorable members. I think uh, we should be clear on the uh, way uh, forward, and I would uh, give the department uh, uh, to respond and uh, close on this, as well as uh, the um, parliamentary legal advisor to also respond, so we uh, close on this. But we should be clear what we are dealing with. It is what has been referred back to the department by the Constitutional Court, and it is now before us. If there are other legislations that we need to look into, I would propose, honorable members, let us look into those legislations and engage with the department how to club all these legislations together. But for now, let us engage with what has been put before us and therefore request... Okay, can we please uh, mute our microphones because these conversations that are being held aside are very much audible to us. Uh, we would uh, be very keen, therefore, to follow what uh, uh, processes that uh, would be outlined by the uh, parliamentary legal advisor particularly uh, adhering to the COVID-19 regulations in terms of uh, public hearings. But uh, let us uh, hand over to the department for the last bite so we can close on the matter and the legal advisor. TG? Thank you. I will invite uh, Advocate Ramasala to respond to any issue that may still be outstanding. Then I'll deal with the issue that was raised by Honorable Stain. Thank you, DJ. Advocate. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. The the starting with the concern still raised by Honorable Stain, the 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 process of reviewing communal interest, it's a it's a comprehensive uh, process. It it looks at all all the different laws that apply in the different parts of our country uh, relating to common land tenure uh, in general. So we're not only looking at, at specific, um, if, if you look at the, if you looked at Clara, for instance, uh, it had a schedule that um, either amended or repealed certain laws that already exist, and, and there are many such laws. So we are looking at them comprehensively. So that process is all encompassing. We are not looking only at specific, but all the laws that, that apply, that, that require to be consistent with the new constitutional dispensation. I, I can only assure her that the review process is comprehensive, is looking at all the laws that, that still apply in different parts of our country that, that relate to, to communal land. Uh, the, the concern by Honorable Mbabama, we, we we are not starting afresh with the review. We, we, it's something that has been ongoing. It's something that is running parallel. Uh, as we've indicated, we have committed to have the Communal Land Tenure Bill tabled in Parliament next year. Um, Honorable Ma Masipa, the, the publication of, 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 of the bill, it's true that we would have preferred to publish, to publish the bill. But even if we, we 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 would have done that, Parliament will still be required in terms of of its roles to to publish the bill uh, for 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 comment and public participation. Um, yes, it's true that we could have referred the bill to the National of Traditional Leaders in in its uh, formative stage, but Parliament Parliament still has an obligation to refer the bill to 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 that uh, particular house because it, it's a Section 76 bill. Uh, it deals with, as as uh, Advocate Mshengane has indicated, it involves customary law, uh, customary practices. I think in terms of Section 28 of the Framework Legislation of COCTA, Parliament is required to consult and uh, refer that bill to 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 uh, those national of traditional leaders. Even if we had done it, Parliament will still be required to do it in terms of its own rules. Thank you, Chair. 
Did you? Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the conversion of the deeds of grants uh, into full title in Guazulu Natal, as an example that I made, this is an exercise that was conducted by the provincial government of KwaZulu Natal, I think between 1994 uh, up until uh, 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can provide uh, Honorable Stain and the committee with the relevant legislation and the processes that they had followed. If you recall, the the provincial government of KwaZulu Natal specifically focused on the townships that were under Ingonyama Trust. As you know, there's uh, quite a number of black townships under Ingonyama Trust, and uh, they used provincial legislation and other legislation to make sure that they upgrade Tanya, the, the, the deeds of grants, uh, into full title. We can provide that information to Honorable State, but it was not led by this department. It was led by the provincial government. Thank you, Chair. There is nothing further to add. Thank you, uh, legal advisor. And we have the legal advisor. Uh, hi, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just speak on the questions raised by Honorable Papa Amateur regarding the issue of a uh, piecemeal amendment uh, of the legislation. So, and also just to state what I've already mentioned, Chairperson, that the committee is dealing with this bill as an executive bill referred by the committee, a technical one that responds to the, to the two judgments. However, Chairperson, the process for lawmaking is that it is in three ways. One is, is an executive bill, as is the situation now with the bill before the committee. The, uh, the second one is the committee bill, which is a bill that is developed by the committee when it sees a gap in legislation and resolves to develop a committee bill. And the third one is a private member's bill, where an individual member sponsors a bill in line with the Ambrosini judgment. So that those are the three available options when it comes to lawmaking, Chairperson. And that lastly, in the rules, Chair, the committee is at liberty to approach the House for permission to inquire into other provisions of the principal legislation uh, which are not being amended by the bill as introduced, if the committee is so persuaded, uh, Chairperson. So there is also that option just to, to, to avail, just to uh, present to the committee Chairperson, the options that the committee has uh, uh, in, regard to, in regard to this bill and the general lawmaking process, uh, Chairperson, when, when it comes to amending legislation. Thank you, Chairman. I hope it, it covers Honorable Papama's question. My answer. Thanks. Thank you, uh, DG and uh, the uh, officials of the department for your responses. Also, let us uh, thank uh, the responses or the introductory remarks from the Honorable Minister Umamuti Diza were to leave and attend to other uh, matters uh, of uh, the department. Uh, let us also uh, appreciate and uh, uh, welcome the responses uh, and the guidelines uh, put to us uh, by the uh, parliamentary legal advisor. And I think uh, from here, honorable members, we will uh, look into how we uh, apply our uh, thinking in terms of public participation during these uh, uh, challenging times, uh, living under COVID reg uh, regulations. Uh, we uh, thank you uh, then uh, for participation. Let us, uh, honorable members, attend to other matters uh, of uh, the committee, uh, which we have minutes uh, that uh, we would like to dispense of. Let us uh, go into the set of meet minutes, if I can also just uh, pick them up uh, from Me Cynthia Maledu. Are you able to uplift uh, the, 
the minutes. Are you able to load them? Mamuka Kaza Manyamza, may you assist with the minutes? Wilson well, is going to send it through to you, Chair. It is the minutes of the 29 May, 4 June, and 10 June. Yes, I'm uh, also trying to uh, open them up uh, on my other gadget, okay? We have been able to see them on our screen, so can we proceed with the minutes of the 29th of May? Page one. Page two. Page three. Can I have a mover for the adoption of the minutes? Chairperson, I will move yeah. the adoption. Thank you, Honorable Briet, uh, for moving for the adoption of the minutes of the 29th of May 2020. Can I have a second? Chairperson, I will second. Honorable Marshall will uh, second the adoption of um, the minutes of the 29th of May. Any matters arising, honorable members? Page one. Page two. Page three. Thank you, honorable members. We take uh, the minutes of the 29th of May as uh, duly adopted. And we proceed uh, with the minutes of uh, the 10th of uh, May. Fourth. No, fourth, sorry, the fourth. Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. And we have a mover for the adoption of uh, the minutes. I move for adoption of the minutes as flagged as true reflection of what transpired on that meeting. Thank you, Honorable Klappe. Can we have a, a second up for the adoption of the minutes? Chairperson, I will second. Thank you, Honorable Brett. Uh, seconding the adoption of the minutes. Any matters arising, honorable members? Page one. 
page two. Page three. Page four. Page five, honorable members. Take it uh, the minutes of uh, the 4th of June as uh, duly adopted. Thank you, honorable members. May proceed to the last set of minutes. The minutes of the 10th of June, 2020. Page 1. Page 2. Page 3. 